Hello, Ghanaians. A very good evening to all of you. And thank you so much for joining us here on Upfront on the Joy News Channel. It's a Thursday night, the 25th day of November 2021. And we're still discussing the 2022 budget. Well, in Parliament, there are lots of discussions about it. And I want to continue with that discussion. I know there are many of you who have been focused on the e-levy, for instance, you've asked yourself that simple question, how is that going to impact you and how is that going to impact your business also? I know there are lots of you, particularly the young ones, who are concerned about jobs. Well, in the budget, we've been talking about a you start because, well, the government says they want to ensure that you get to start your own business. That's if you're a young man and you get to become your own boss, not just your own boss, but also contributing to the growth of this country and employing other persons. In the words of the government, they are looking at employing or creating one million jobs by end of 2023, 2024. We're looking at a three-year period. But this evening, my focus or our focus is on a very important part of our budget because we're looking at revenue and grants totaling 100 billion Ghana cities. Tax revenue, 80 billion Ghana cities. But of course, if you look at some other provisions in there or some other expenditures, you may be concerned because we're looking at wages and salaries of 35 billion Ghana cities. We're looking at interest payments. Now, mind you, these are just interest payments of 37 billion Ghana cities. If we're to compare that to the 2021 figure, we, I mean, estimated to spend some 30 billion Ghana cities on wages and salaries with 35 billion Ghana cities on the payment of interest. But the critical question is, how do we ensure that we are able to generate enough revenue? How do we ensure that we are able to raise much revenue? Because the president has been speaking, he's been tasking the National Development Planning Commission to find ways of ensuring that we are able to raise lots of revenue as a country. In the words of the president, that, we, I mean, that our tax to GDP is 14%, is not the best compared to, say, Togo, 18% and according to, I mean, the total 22% and according to ECOWAS, ECOWAS countries should have a tax to GDP of not less than 20%. We're doing 14 according to the president, but if you were to look at the fact that we're, I mean, in 2020, we're looking at tax revenue of 55 billion and you compare that to our projected GDP of 431 billion, you're looking at less than 13%, in fact, 12.7%. So that is certainly not a good one. This evening, I want us to look at how we can generate revenue. The budget has been talking about some of these things, how they believe we can do that. We also want to find out whether there are other means of doing so, but also of importance, how do we reduce infrastructure, how do we reduce expenditures? My name is Winston Amwa, and this is Upfront on the Journey Channel. When we return after these messages, I'll be introducing my guests, and then we get into the conversation. Right, so welcome back and thank you very much for staying with us here on Upfront on the Joy News Channel. And tonight we're privileged uh, to have economist and associate professor at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Lord Mensah. Uh, good evening, Professor Mensah, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, good evening and uh, good evening to our viewers, Winston. Great, so let's start off with, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, even before we get into the details, I'm sure you've been monitoring or following up the uh, discussions of the budget in Parliament so far. Uh, what's been your assessment of these discussions? Yeah, well, I think um, I've not been following it uh, as expected. Um, uh, normally, at the time of debate, I'll be in the office uh, and I don't have those uh, media structures uh, around. But what I know uh, very well, which is going to take, you know, a center stage of the discussions is about the E-Levy. And uh, obviously, um, my understanding is that uh, a government, after looking at the economic structure of the country, has identified that space to be an active space uh, when it comes to economic activities, and therefore try to migrate, you know, some revenue collection in that regard. When you look at, you know, revenue collection, normally you put it at where the economy is active, and so. Uh, that is what uh, I know is going to take a center stage of the discussions. 
coupled with um, the road tolls that has been removed. Um, you clearly, you, you understand that um, if the road toll is giving us um, about 78 million Ghana cities a month, at least for the next one month, we are going to lose that money. And as a country that is struggling for revenue generation, we cannot afford to allow that to go. Um, I'm hoping that the government will get a replacement for these funds that we are losing. And uh, I believe it was kind of uh, a knee jerk decision mm. uh, to, to, to take off you know, the road tolls completely as expected because the revenue that we try to, I mean, rake in to neutralize this uh, road tolls had not kicked in yet. And if you look at the budget processes, um, after the uh, budget readings at parliament, there should be a debate on it before it goes to appro uh, approval, then implementation. And so we're about we are left with about you know three stages before we come to a conclusion of accepting the budget that was read. So I think the speed at which uh, we took off the road tolls um, wasn't uh, good for the country. Mm. Now let's get to I mean you've raised a very important issue, but today, I mean you've talked about um, generating revenue, and I know there's been lots of conversation about the e, I mean e levy. But one of the things I want us to look at also because government has been talking about it has to do with burden sharing. Okay, now, one of the things the finance minister said was that we've reached a stage where we have to share the burden, and some of these measures are, uh, you know, in order to ensure the burden sharing that he talks about. Now, if you look at the appendix, you would see that the Office of Government Machinery Budget is reduced from 863 million in 2021, projected, I mean, we're not done with the year yet, but uh, in 2022, we're looking at a project, an estimated 750 million Ghana cities, so about 100 million Ghana cities reduction. Now, would you say that is significant considering that government has been talking about burden sharing and also reducing unwanted expenditure or wasteful expenditure? Well, uh, Winston, if you look at uh, the budget structure, um, clearly the government machinery, uh, we're looking at those ministries that were created under the presidency and all those, about five ministries as of the time. And when we were coming into the second term of the, of the government, um, those ministries were more or less absorbed directly under the presidency. So that kind of administration they were running um, were not going to be the same administration. Uh, if I should put it, administration was going to be flattened. And so, and then the projects that they were going into were projects that was earmarked for a particular term. And going into the second term, I wasn't expecting much expenditure to go yes, in but that Prof, direction. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at 2021. And so these yes. ministries that you talk about were actually absorbed into the office of uh, the president, and no. office of government machinery. Now, following the decision to scrap some of these ministries, in 2021, the uh, estimated wages, I mean, uh, and, and salaries for the, the whole office is 800, over 850 million. Now, we're looking at a situation where that has been reduced by 100 million Ghana cities. Isn't that significant? Because here we're looking at second term, and so we're no longer looking at the period where you would say that, I mean, we had a lot of people within the Office of Government Machinery. Is that not significant when you look at burden sharing and a cost reduction strategy in the 2022 budget? Well, uh, you see, when you talk about costs in, a, in an administration, you have to look at the benefit as well. We cannot just look at the cost by reducing it by 100 you know, million margin and say that it is significant and it, 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 it portrays you know, that kind of burden sharing that we're looking at. And like I said earlier, the kind of administration that was being run when the ministry was being stand alone um, will be different from when it is being absorbed directly into you know, the presidency. Now we don't have substantive ministers for these ministries. We don't have you know, other expenditures that will go to this um, uh, ministry. So obviously it has a tendency of reducing you know, the kind of uh, monies that will be allocated for um, this ministry. So I'm not surprised to see that margin of reduction. But um, as to the being significant or not, let's consider the benefits that those ministries you know, created when they were fully active 
you know, relative to now that they are being absorbed into the presidency. Now, being absorbed into the presidency, what is going to be their function? As we speak now, those functions are not clearly out. And so if we are going to look at this and say, because they have reduced the expenditure by that margin, and as a result of that, it has been significant to indicate, you know, burden sharing, I don't believe in that. Well, well okay, so I mean, the, the, the point I raised was that, you know, in 2021, when the president was making appointments, he had actually indicated that, uh, you know, these uh, ministries were going to become departments under the office of uh, the president. And sure. so, I mean, right from this year, that had been the case. And if we look at 2022, the fact that, I mean, there's still departments under the presidency, but of course, the wages and salaries have reduced. You're looking at the Ministry of Planning uh, now, I mean, a unit under the presidency. Uh, you're also looking at uh, Zongo Development, uh, Zongo and yeah, Industry Development. Special initiative. Special initiative, which have become, and monitoring and evaluation, the, I mean, these are, which has also become a unit under the presidency. So more of uh, trying to reduce this. But let's look at one other thing. And so let's look at one other thing which has come up, because the president in, um, you know, uh, launching or in swearing into office the commissioners of the National Development Planning Commission talked about how we should be looking at generating or raising revenue. He likens our, uh, you know, tax to GDP ratio of 14% to the sub-regional average of 18% and even the ECOWAS margins of, uh, you know, uh, minimum 20%. But our own checks would indicate that uh, if you look at a projected tax to GDP of, um, you know, 55 billion in the 2021 budget and projected GDP of 431 billion uh, Ghana cities. So you're looking at a tax to GDP of some, uh, you know, 12.7 percent. This is woefully inadequate. I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, um, e levy and all of that. But beyond the e levy, I mean, today I want us to move away from the e levy a little bit. Let us look at practically how we can increase revenue generation in this country to catch up with the uh, sub-regional average of 18%, even before we get to ECOWAS's minimum of 20%. Yeah, um, if you look at uh, revenue generation, you have to look at the various you know, sectors of the economy. Mm. And you realize that over the past year, the investment, you see, the revenue that you're targeting must be preceded with certain investments, certain expenditure into certain areas that you will be targeting in the future. Now you realize that the past years, the investment that we've been making strongly has been, and which is yielding, has been on digitization. And so if we are moving away from that, then the question you need to ask yourself is, how have we empowered you know, the private sector as an economic type, the second force? So we will be going there to tax them as expected. That has not been the case. If you look at government activities over the years, you realize that the central government has taken a, a, you know, the economic activities upon itself. And clearly, you, you, you get to know that the, 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 the structures that will allow the private sector to operate, uh, such as reduction in interest at the banking or um, accessibility of funds and all those, were not very you know, strong. And so if you are looking at alternatives, um, I think, you know, the government's hands are tied in that. And I believe that is why the focus has been on the digitization. And if you look at investment, clearly it tells you that the options are not there. You cannot go and tax someone who is not economically active. You know, that is why the little, you know, um, 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 tax introduction at the level of the private sector, you see a lot of complaints coming. So that means that a lot of investment has not gone in that direction. Policies has not favored, you know, those sectors. And that is why when, you know, you introduce taxes, it becomes a problem. And, you know, that should have been the alternative for the country anyway. Well, let's look at something, a point that you make. You, you've talked about, uh, you know, interest rates, lending rates. And um, even before we get into... Uh, 2022, we have seen the Bank of Ghana, uh, you know, raising the policy rate to 14.5%. How mm -hmm. is that going to impact the quest for private sector growth and by extension, increase in consumption and so increase in revenue? 
Well, let me put a statement here. You see, uh, the, when I saw the increment in the policy rate by that 150 basis point, you know, I was surprised. But later, I thought of wise and I realized that the central bank has that kind of independence to take decisions on its own. Um, we realized that the central bank does, you know, this monetary policy mechanism is being used to target inflation, yeah. you know, the possible exposures when it comes to exchange rate and all those. And for the, from, from, from the outlook, you realize that looking at uh, fuel prices and all those on the market and uh, the trajectory that the global prices are going, um, clearly it gives you the signal that um, uh, fuel prices are going to go up and it can feed into all you know, um, 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 operations and, uh, and the economic dynamics of the country. Like we always say, it has been the spine of the economy of the swap. And then also another focus was missing, um, which was the possibility of reducing interest rate at the corridors of the bank. Um, you, you realize that, you know, the policies that were being, I mean, called out during the budget readings, especially uh, the use start and all those, the intention clearly came out that we're going to channel those policies at the corridors of the banks. And so um, if you look at the, the, the way we price loans, um, taking into consideration the Ghana reference rate, which the main drivers of this rate is the uh, monetary policy rate and then the exchange rate, sorry, um, the TBO rate. Um, clearly, you realize that when the monetary policy rate goes up, it has a tendency of affecting you know, this Ghana reference rate. And if you look at the Ghana reference rate, coupled with the borrowers, you know, uh, what we call it, tendency of payment, which we call it the, the risk premium that the banks will look out for, it will definitely, you know, propel, you know, uh, um, interest rates upwards. And, and so uh, it, it will make, you know, loan pricing, you know, um, 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 very high for the average, you know, um, borrower. And so I wasn't, you know, so comfortable when it was, it, it was increased. But let me clearly tell you that the central bank has that kind of independency when they're looking at um, 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 the macroeconomic economic yes, but, great, great, but um, yes, the central bank has that independence. But in a country where we say we're unable to collect a lot of direct taxes, indirect taxes has become the way to go for us. In targeting indirect taxes, the more we spend, the more we get indirect taxes because these are found, I mean, are found on goods. Sure. Now, if we have the situation where people's disposable income is reduced, how is that going to trigger the kind of consumption that we need to also trigger an increase in revenue generation? Obviously, it's going to, I mean, affect, you know, revenue there is generation through the, those indirect taxes that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. These are taxes that comes with spending. The more I buy fuel, the more I spend time, I, I spend uh, some luxury activities out there, enjoying some hotels and all those. I mean, these are taxes that I must pay. And but then if my disposable income is very low, uh, you don't expect me to go and enjoy um, this, uh, what we call it, uh, activities. And that is why usually sometimes government will give room for deferment of taxes, thinking that these activities will go and generate, you know, that kind of economic activity that we are expecting to reap this indirect taxes back. But that has not been the case. If you take, for instance, the 50% the discount on uh, these imports that um, those importers were enjoying, Clearly, it was a deferment of possible revenue that the government was supposed to have, so that these goods comes into the country, and as a result of you know people spending on them indirectly, the government can rake in some revenue. But I believe that wasn't the case um, as expected, and that is why government has reverted the situation and then come back to 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 hold up the funds as and when they are coming in to make sure that they use it for the purpose that is required. So, so, I mean, let's get it clearly. You, 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 you're suggesting to us that um, based on, one, just the increase in uh, monetary policy rate and the possible increase in petroleum prices, which could trigger an increase in transport fares, the estimated 80 billion 
that we're targeting may not, and, and over here we're using uh, you know, con conditions here, may not be achieved. I mean, because with to probability, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you're talking about the future here. Yes, I, I'm asking you, we said based on how we have started in the last quarter of the year, these projections may not be achieved. Is that what you're saying? Looking at into the 2020, 2022 uh, budget, the target for revenue and all those. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, obviously we may not achieve that because, um, you know, like uh, I was saying earlier, the disposable income of individuals are going to reduce over the years. I mean, over the months ahead. And if the government wants to rake in from, you know, these um, activities, then obviously it's not going to be as expected. And then also, if you look at um, what is happening at, 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 at the spaces that the government is targeting for its uh, revenue generation, Obviously, economic activities will start reducing in those areas. And like last time we we're discussing, um, if you look at this yield levy, it's part of the hundred billion. No, sorry, the proportions of taxes that the government was raking. And like I said earlier, a lot of transactions are going to go off that space for now um, to see what is going to happen going forward before they start coming back. And so uh, we shouldn't expect that eighty billion. Um, of taxes to be come, uh, come easy as far as the government uh, revenue generation is concerned. So we have looked at what the problem is now. What I want us to do is to look at what we could have done differently or what we should be doing differently when it comes to increasing revenue. So let's start with, so we know the policy rates, I mean, that has gone up now. But we also do know that the prices of petroleum product is one major factor when it comes to inflation, and that in itself also affects the policy rate. As a government that wants to increase revenue generation, what should the government have done? And over here, we're not going to talk about uh, you know increasing, tax, yeah, I mean, widening tax net because it's obvious we have not been able to achieve that ever since um, I started following budgets in 1995. We've talked about that. We're still talking about it, but. What should the government have done to ensure that these challenges that we are talking about are minimized so we could talk about increasing revenue generation, particularly through indirect taxes in 2022? Well, uh, Winston, you see, we always, we, as we speak now, we've been targeting revenue, mm -hmm. okay? But you realize that the revenue generation goes hand in hand with expenditure. Sure. If you look at, relate the, 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 the revenue target for last year's budget and the, the increase that we have done, you realize that it's about over 14 billion. The same increment we have, you know, built it up into our expenditure. So the question is if you are not able to generate that revenue, are you supposed to, you know, hold it up there that you're going to still hold on with your expenditure? Why don't you focus on expenditure cutting? And the question will be that, which areas are we supposed to cut when it comes to expenditure? Mm -hmm. I always split our expenditure into two. We have the discretionary one, which we have control over as a country. And then we have non-discretionary ones, which of course, we are talking about interest payment and then our you know, salary compensation and all those. Now, effectively, the ones that we have control over is the, you know, the capital expenditure, the grants allocation to other, you know, institutions, government institutions, and all those. If you have control over this one, why don't you spend that in a revenue enhanced, you know, um, areas, so that for every penny that you spend, you can generate the corresponding revenue that is expected of this expenditure. So effectively, we can go up. Now, today I got a report that IEA is calling for a cap on our, you know, debt um, accumulations. Mm. Effectively, for me, I see it to be a good call because it takes us back to where we were as far as IMF is concerned. When IMF came, they, 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 they indicated that our budget deficit should be around 5% of our GDP. In a way, because if you create a deficit, that is when you finance this deficit. Now, if you don't create a deficit, you will definitely find you will not finance anything. So effectively, if we should go back and then cap some of these indicators, 
They should be able to help us. Now let's look at capital expenditure. Apart from the political undertone, that will give the politician a platform to say that I'm going to give you roads. I'm going to give you that. I mean, if you take it economically, I would say that it's about time we privatize roads. It's about time we allow the private man to come in. How, how, to how, how, are, you going to, how are you going to privatize roads when you have decided to abolish road tolls? Well, the private man knows how to go about it. We leave how, it for how, them. How, how is the private man going to go about it? How is he going to get his well, money? When the road tolls were abolished, right, mm -hmm. we have cars on the road. Every year we go and do our road wedding. Mm -hmm. Now, if you calculate the number of times I travel across a particular road toll, right, you realize that maybe I might not travel maybe 50 times or no. It all boils down to feasibility studies. Mm -hmm. And this can be slapped onto, you know, um, the road tolls and be taken up front, okay? And once it's taken, the whole year you have the liberty to drive, you know, through the roads, I'm uh, sorry, the tolls uh, as, as we have it now. So there are so many ways of, you know, I mean, taking this road tolls. It's not everywhere that you go, that you're going to see physical, you know, um, um, structures that has been mounted for road tolls. It can be slapped on so many things. How does the government collect it, I mean, levy when it comes to fuel consumption and all those? It's been slapped on the, on the prices as you buy at the pump, you know, level. So effectively, there, there are so many ways to go about it. And it's about time we offload this expenditure of our, you know, let me call it our budget, so that the budget will be trimmed to be manageable. Because if we turn out to be holding everything at the, at the central government... Well, 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 but I mean, the, the issue, I mean, the, the issue, you're looking at, I mean, total infrastructure investment in roads, around 1.3 billion Ghana cities. So, I mean, of the 16 billion Ghana cities that we uh, want to spend as uh, capital expenditure, you're looking at just, um, you know, less than 10% of it going into the road sector. How much is that? I mean, that, that's not, that's insignificant. One point, you see, less than 10 billion. You see, Winston, uh, Winston, this wasn't the case earlier uh, in, in some years back. If you take, I mean, funds that were going into roads since 2017, in fact, look at the, you know, the total expenditure that is going into, you know, capital expenditure related to the total expenditure. You realize that over the years it has been reducing. It has reduced from 17% of the total expenditure all the way down to about 10%. That means that we are killing the future. If we don't have the money to build our infrastructures, why don't you source externally so that the private man will come directly instead of the government going to the market to grow, say that we're going to borrow, right, to come and what? Invest in infrastructure. Why wouldn't you allow the private man to come directly, come and assess the situation? and see if they can build, operate it for some time, maybe 15 years, 20 years, and revert back to the government. So effectively, it's, a, it's because we have what? We have taken all this, you know, upon ourselves as a kind of um, government expendi uh, expenditure. That is why we see our expenditure being blown out of proportion every now and then, calling for unnecessary borrowing. And as a result of that, um, we keep on derailing about our budget lines every now and then. So for me, it's about time we seek external funding, but not through, you know, borrowing, but rather allowing the private man to come in, come and assess, you know, certain areas that they can invest in and possibly invest direct. Of course, when they, we, they invest and we, they, they reap their in, investment with a, possible, with a possible interest, obviously we, we can have the infrastructure back. Mm. Now, now, now the, the, the grants you talk about, I mean, even before we get to the grants, I mean, you're asking them to come and invest. Well, uh, there's a challenge in there. But when you look at the grants that you talked about, some of these are statutory grants. Now, there's been a capping of even uh, state institutions. And so some of the government institutions, if they generate IGF, that's internally generated funds, there's a cap. So it gets uh, you know, to the government again, the consolidated fund. The law is very clear on total revenues generated, and it's expected that not less than 5% should go into, for instance, um, the should assembly's common fund. So there are laws there, okay? There are laws there that says this is how much you should. So these are statutory payments. Nothing can be done about it, uh, Professor Lord Mensah. Yeah, Winston, you see, the laws were made by us, mm -hmm. okay? That is why we have parliament. 
you look at the structures carefully. Some time ago, if we're dealing with 5% that must go into, you know, um, what do we call it? Um, the, um, um, the control and account engine. At this time, we're not looking at that because the situation has changed. Now, it's about time we allow various institutions to be, in a way, self-dependent. Some municipals, as we speak now, can be self-dependent. They can pay, if you look at the resources they have, they can pay their own staff, go into project, borrow against certain cash flows in the future, rather than allowing the central bank to borrow on the nation's behalf. And when the money comes, the way it is being disintegrated, we don't even know, and we don't even get to know the specificities of what it is being done. So effectively, I would say that, yes, of course, it makes sense. We had laws, but you know, finance and laws are quite dynamic. Things have changed. It's about time we revisit them and realize that some of these institutions can be self-dependent. Why don't we allow them? Okay. And talking about self-dependence, let's look at the assemblies. We have additional assemblies common fund. Accra Metropolitan Assembly, Tema Metropolitan Assembly, Tema West Municipal Assembly. I mean, we have about 260 of uh, you know MMDC. Uh, MMDAs, and all of them rely on government every quarter. There are those who have said, why don't we take some of them off the common fund and channel these monies into other sectors of the economy? First, is it feasible, bearing in mind that even, even the monies that are expected to be paid to them are sometimes in areas two quarters three quarters. Yeah, I mean, let's look at this. There are two streams we may have to look at. When you take, for instance, Accra um, AMA, right? AMA has two options when it comes to uh, maybe project expansion or providing certain amenities in a, within you know, the enclave. You get to understand that AMA as it stands, has a revenue sources, right? That it's, you know, collects from the people. Apart from that, AMA can identify a profitable uh, project and borrow against the possible cash flows that will come from this project. And so we shouldn't look at it as if, okay, fine. These assemblies or municipals are, hand, you know, handicapped to the extent that they cannot generate on their own. Like I said, they have revenue generation sources. They have, you know, possibility of identifying projects that can be solved for, you know, sustaining, going to it, and then what? Later pay for the project. And so why don't we allow them to do that? And it all boils down to the laws that we have in this country. You see, some of these laws were adopted when, you know, the central government was providing for the people some years back. You need to understand that as a country, we started, we started borrowing somewhere 2007. And the moment you start borrowing, it gives you that kind of business, you know, undertone. So this socially oriented approach, which brought about most of these laws that we have, that the state should always make provision for certain basic structures for, you know, its citizens. It's about time we move away from that and look at how the various units within the state can be self-dependent and then identify projects that can benefit and then projects that can generate the necessary you know, cash that is needed for the country. And, and, and talking about borrowing, we have been borrowing uh, you know, since independence, but um, let's look at the plan in the budget, property taxes, property rates, that government wants to help the assemblies collect them because we are talking about you know, these assemblies over dependence on government. And the government is saying, we want to help you collect these and so into a pool, and then we'll be able to use them for development. Good idea? Yes, I mean, it is a good idea. You know, government has invested in that direction. We've identified properties, and we were here, we invested in digital address system, over 2 million, you know, um, Ghana cities. We are here to, you know, reap the benefit of that investment. So if we have identified the, these uh, added properties, and then, you know, government is going to help the assemblies to collect revenue in that direction, I think it should be able to help us. But then let's understand it. You see, 
it's not that people don't want to pay property tax or um, it, it will be tough getting revenue from that, you know, property taxes. But sometimes so, locations of some of these properties, the government itself might not necessarily get that kind of confidence to go to these people and ask for, you know, property, you know, talk. Because, you know, look at where I live, for instance. I go off-road for about 15 to 20 minutes. Mm. And going off-road means that at the end of the month, when I pay my payee, right, and pay those indirect taxes that we're talking about, I must buy shocks every six months. Mm. This becomes a double cost. If the government can absorb this, you know, shock expenditure through provision of what? Roads to my house. Why won't I pay for this property tax when the government comes for it? Where I live, I have to invest in my own water supply because I'm not connected to the national grid. And so this is a double cost to me if the government should come to collect certain, you know, um, toll from me. So effectively, it's not that people, we may not want to pay, you know, um, 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 property tax. But then the locations of some of these properties accessibility becomes a problem mm -hmm. so even the agents that will be sent to go and collect this revenue might not even go so these are some of the things we need to we need to look at i mean when it comes to the uh the, the, the property you know tax collections but for me it is a very good idea um i always say that you know revenue collection when you lose all your resources right the last bit of it is the human resource and you collect revenue around human activities. And that is why government, you know, uses taxes as a last resort every now and then. Sure. Once you miss your, uh, what do you call it? You miss your, your gold, you miss your timber, you miss your diamonds and all those. What is left for you is your human resource. And so if you, human beings are creating activities and you tax them in that direction, I don't have problem with that. But when there is no economic activity, and then you keep on introducing tax every now and then obviously you will get to something we call tax fatigue and when this tax fatigue sets in um you will not get it right the people will rebel and you know you will not get anything at all let's look at one of the main you know avenues that government seeks to create jobs um, create one million jobs over the next three years but also as you're creating jobs and as you're solving underemployment you're increasing uh, you know, people's um, income, and as you increase their incomes, they're going to be spending. So indirect taxes would come your way. Uh, it's a long way of making sure that uh, you're able to propel growth in your economy. Let's look at the U start, and you know, it's one of the major policies for 2022. 10 billion cities. So government is looking at over the period, uh, over the next three years, investing. Uh, three billion. We're looking at um, you know our development partners investing two billion over the next three years, and we're also looking at uh, the financial institutions in Ghana investing some five billion. We're looking at uh, giving startups between uh, ten to fifty thousand, also helping them to acquire equipment. But government has also talked about the fact that having realized that in the past there's been challenges with uh, you know bookkeeping and all of that, there will be skills training in ensuring that these persons get to understand what it is they're about to do. The implementing agencies would be the Ghana Enterprise Agency and the National Entrepreneurial and Innovation Program. You start. Is this the policy that would transform the economy, create jobs, and by extension, help us generate revenue? I'm very good at wasting. Um, you see, if you look at the dynamics of the policies of the government, you will come to understand that you start is more or less um, a graduation of the NACO, right? And then also, it is a graduation of some of the initiatives that were introduced uh, when uh, we had the NBSSI and the government pumped about 600 million, you know, Ghana cities mm -hmm. into NBSSI's activities. I'm looking at it this way. By this time, for the past three years, four years that we had that intervention, by this time, NBSSI should have a pool of businesses that have started. Yes, but Prof, the, 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 the 600 maturity. million was last year. 
The six hundred million well, was, it last, was year. last year. I'm oh, sorry about that. It was yes, last year because of COVID. But then, yes. yes. But then, economic activities were created around this, you know, six hundred million. Mm. And I know very well that MBSSI at this time should have a database of businesses that started, and they are almost what you know coming out of that incubation mm. state. And for me, that should be a starting point. It is a very good idea. And all those that were in the NACOP, you know, policy, I believe that is not everybody that can be, uh, you know, an entrepreneur. So the fact that it's a new start shouldn't be that anybody that goes out there, you know, to, 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 to borrow, um, we, should, we should lend money to the person. And I'm happy that this policy is going to be channeled through the corridors of what? The banks. Because the banks have the expertise to identify which sectors of the economy are active. And so if you develop your business plan and you show economic prospect as far as your business is concerned, of course, the bank will be ready to finance you. And like you said, it comes with capacity building. And it's not like we are going to start from, you know, I mean, the moon, or we're going to start afresh. There's, there, there are some baselines that we may have to look at especially when you go into the pool of the MBSSI. They should be able to tell us that these were businesses that benefited from the 600 million, and they are businesses that are ongoing. And as a result of that, if we should help them to you know, assess funding, they, will, they can expand. And by expansion, they can absorb some of this NACO, uh, NACO uh, you know, uh, should I call them graduate or uh, empl employees. Mm. But one other point that has come up also is the fact that, yes, I, I, we know that as part of the uh, coronavirus alleviation and uh, revitalization enterprise support scheme, that's the Ghana Cares program, um, you know, existing and, uh, industries will be supported as a way of ensuring that they're able to, you know, grow and create more jobs. But there are some who have made the point that, well, 10 billion over the period the next three years going into startups and all and creating new and I mean creating entrepreneurs uh, shouldn't we be thinking of investing this uh, I mean adding this to the allocation already dedicated to existing industries since these existing industries create between 60 to 80 percent of new jobs and also bearing in mind that uh, you know uh, startup the percentage of startups that are expected to fail in Ghana is 74 percent. See, uh, when it comes to, if you understand what we call venture capital financing very well, you will come to understand that for startups, we don't do a wholesale, you know, financing. Okay. They are strategic because you give a statistics that it's not every business that starts that can work, generate. In Ghana, 74 percent. Right. Collapse. Fantastic. Right. Now you get to understand that it is quite risky to invest funds wholesale in those areas. So you have to be careful and be selective, the kind of investment or the kind of startups that you will be targeting. And like I said earlier, you mentioned that there, there are already existing businesses that can absorb, you know, some of this labor force that we're looking at, you know, into the employment sector. Um, the other hand, we may also look at startups that have prospects, okay? Mm. And I presume that at this time, with some of the initiatives that we've placed, if you look at administration upon administration, let's not throw some documents away. You realize that NBSSI was existing and now it's what? National Entrepreneur Award. No, um, the NBSSI is now Ghana Enterprise Agency. Uh, an enterprise agency. Exactly. If you look at the dynamics, you will understand that if you go to them, they should be able to give you data of businesses that have been that's, that were started and now they're about to germinate, and therefore that that should be a target. Okay. So that if they have this information, the banks have this information, and these businesses go to the bank, they truly knows you know exactly where to put the money. We should understand that we cannot do wholesale financing when it comes to startups because it's a risk, risky area. And because it is a risky area, you have to be careful and very sensitive in terms of, you know, your selections of the kind of, you know, businesses you may have to finance as a startup. So that won't be like um, something that we are sharing and people go and queue. And then at the end of the day, the government cannot even account for the funds that have been invested in that area. 
If we are pumping 10 billion, I'm expecting that in the next maybe 10 years, we can boast of about, let's say, uh, 15 billion out of this investment. Mm. Well, 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 the government makes the point that uh, the plan is to create 1 million jobs. And again, that creates the, some of us argue that this actually creates another avenue for focusing on quantity and not sustainable jobs. And so we, go, we start with an attempt to create more jobs so we can come back and say we have created one million jobs and not ensuring that we have businesses that can, I mean, that are sustainable. And so beyond the three years, the five years, 10 years, we would come back and say this is what we did uh, during the Ghana Cares program. You see, Winston, if the government does this investment, mm. which is about 10 billion, and in the end, in the next uh, um, 10 to 15 years, we are not able to tax those who will be employed consistently in this initiative, it's a loss to the country. So that is the only way the government can say that we did this investment, and in the end, we are reaping this benefit, apart from the export and the possible transactions indirect and direct that can go on that we will benefit from as a country we should be able to create sustainable jobs out of this and like we said earlier you know we should be sensitive in the kind of you know startups that will be targeted it shouldn't be startups that will be geared towards um maybe uh doing that you know wholesale kind of um, um uh, provision for funds you know for individuals and for businesses and in the end we may not get anything out. So for me, it is a good call, but then we should be careful how we go about it. And that, that's why I mentioned that, you know, I'm happy the banks have been involved, you know, in this initiative, because already the banks are very careful when they are doing, you know, resource allocations. And in the form, I don't know how much, you know, the government will be doing in terms of lending to these banks and how might they going to do on lending to you know um, those individuals who have the startup and i presume that comparing this to the normal interest rate that we have on the market is there's going to be a huge discount for those businesses. well, well government, government talks about soft loans and so once we're talking about yeah, soft well, loans. If, it, if it's a soft loan of course it's, it's not going to be as the market rate I exactly mean, there's going to be a huge discount and so yes i mean that's uh, not a to be at the market rate but when you read the document, I mean, um, when you read the document and when you look at where we have come from as a people, because this would not be the first time we have tried this, um, we actually had the, you know, um, local enterprise skills development program, uh, LESDEP, we had the youth enterprise skills development program, um, yes. Uh, we've also had um, uh, the Ghana uh, Youth uh, you know, Enterprise and Entrepreneurial Development Agency, GIDA, we've had YES Youth Enterprise Support Scheme, which became national entrepreneurial and innovation program and we so when you look at all of these programs that we've had over the period and if you look at the policy that has been put out there would you say there's been lessons learned yeah i mean uh winston you see clearly there seem to be lessons learned here you know uh in the past all the initiatives that we've been talking about were being handled by state agencies and ministries and all those but now you clearly in the budget it was indicated that we're going to use the banks and to the extent of establishing national development bank yeah. you know so effectively there seem to be some lessons learned here you have been driving of this instead of the government empowering its own agencies to i mean go into certain policy initiatives why don't you channel some of the funds through the corridors of the bank so that the banks who have the expertise who have the technical know-how to identify the areas that are active as far as the economy is concerned they can easily what identify the right places to learn to so i can say that yes there, see, there seem to be um, some lessons you know learned here um, initially um, funds were not being channeled through the, the, the corridors of the bank but this particular one, um, there, there seems to be that kind of um, um, uh, clear indication that, yes, indeed, the, the government is going to use the banks, you know, for this purpose. So it's not everybody that can easily have 
access to funding. And of course, you know, I, I hope it's not going to be a free money to the banks so that they also lend freely. And once you, you lend, you know, or you give out money free, people don't attach seriousness to it. They don't attach, they don't place value on it. And so multiplying it becomes a problem. And so if, you know, the, 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 the government is going to use the banks, then I would say that um, lessons have been learned here. Hmm. Well, government is indicated to be using the banks, and so that would mean that uh, lessons have been learned. Um, Professor Lord Mensah, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us this evening on our front on the Joining Channel. We're very grateful to you uh, that you made time to join us. And of course, we're grateful to you also for making time uh, to watch us here on our front on the Joy News channel. My name is Winston Amwakachu. Tomorrow morning on the Super Morning Show, have a lovely evening.